In this episode, we will deal with F.W. de Klerk's first years as a politician, a junior politician, a backbencher, and then as a young minister in the cabinet of Prime Minister John Forster. F.W. de Klerk, what was it like being a young man going into Parliament in Cape Town for the first time? What were your experiences? What, what was Parliament like? It was extremely challenging, and I was thrilled. I felt this is where I'm going to belong. Parliament was very dignified. Debates were, generally speaking, of a very high standard. I loved the cut and thrust of thinking on your feet, of debating, and uh, it was, generally speaking, uh, a school to be trained in for what was to follow. I enjoyed it very much. Later in my backbench years, I got very frustrated and bored until I was appointed a minister. And uh, you would have made a, a maiden speech at some stage. What, what were, do you remember your maiden speech and what was it about? Yes, it was about a renewal of the law. It was about the establishment of a new law commission, which would look after the reform of our total legal system. It was a bit philosophical, but it was in my field. It uh, resonated with what I studied at university. And uh, without being sort of uh, too self-praising, it went down extremely well. Helen Sussman spoke just after me, and she was glowing in her remarks about my speech. And you would have been in Parliament at the same time that your father was still actively in politics as the, as the President of the Senate. What was it like serving in Parliament with your father in a senior position? It was wonderful. He attended my maiden speech. Wonderful having him on the gallery. Uh, it was, we would sometimes, I would slip away and I would have lunch in his office on the Senate side of the parliamentary building. Uh, we were very close, my father and I, and the, the year or two that we shared being together in parliament was a great pleasure and I enjoyed every minute of it. But now, going down to Cape Town, moving into the government parliamentary village at Acacia Park, away from your, your beautiful home on the banks of the Vaal River in, near Vereniging, what was that like? That must have been quite a traumatic shock. Yes and no. Actually, all of us, not only me, all the other young parliamentarians and the civil service people, regarded it almost like you, were, like you look upon a picnic. It was extraordinary. We were a little village. We mixed well with each other. There was a school. Our small children went to the school. There were tennis courts. Uh, we had braais over and between the various neighbors. Actually, it was pleasant to be together in such a close way with so many colleagues. But of course, one misses your own home, one misses the, the, the advantages that you have in an own home where everything is planned as you wanted it. We lived in a small three-bedroom asbestos home and uh, we were very much upon each other's laps. And what was it? like to be a backbencher. Did backbenchers have any influence in uh, the National Party caucus or were you there just to sit and listen? Well, the, the general rule as a backbencher is speak when you're spoken to, speak when you're asked to speak. But uh, it had its own fun. Being a backbencher means that you rarely get a chance to speak in Parliament initially, until you've proven yourself as a good debater. 
Being a backbencher in caucus meant that's not the place to prove yourself. My father advised me when I entered politics with his experience. Careful of the caucus. That's not the place to impress people. But where we made a difference even as backbenchers was in what was called study groups. For each portfolio in cabinet, there was a study group. And one had a choice to belong to three or five, three to five study groups. I belong to labor, to justice, and to home affairs. And there, one met the minister. One had ample opportunity to give your opinion, even to change legislation or improve legislation. So it wasn't all just being a voice and a, a button to be pushed and then you react. You had times to take initiative. Well, you must have done quite well as a backbencher because after only six years, you were promoted to the cabinet. And this was unusual because most of the time, uh, ministers spent an apprenticeship as a deputy minister, but you went straight to the cabinet. What did your colleagues think about this? And what was your reaction? Well, firstly, there's a story behind it. A year before I was appointed a minister, there were a few vacancies for deputy ministers. And I was wild, widely predicted to be definitely one of those. My father even got an indirect message, be in Cape Town at that time. And then after he and my mother booked into an hotel here, he got another message to say, sorry, but something has come up. It won't be this time. But young was the message from John Foster, you won't have to wait long. So when a year later, I was called in by Mr. Foster, and he offered me the posts of posts and telecommunications and of uh, uh, social welfare, I could fall off the chair. I expected to be appointed a deputy minister. It was a great surprise. But from the time that I was so strongly projected as a future appointment, some of my ambitious colleagues stood a bit away from me. Uh, there was quite a lot of competition and even at times jealousy in our caucus. So uh, I had my enemies too and those who wished that I would trip over my own feet. And what was it like being in John Forster's cabinet. Uh, what sort of leader was he? How did he manage cabinet meetings? Uh, what was his style? John Foster was a good man. He was a warm, friendly man. He had biting wit. Uh, he had a strange way of, of grumbling almost. But he was soft at heart. I liked him, and I think he liked me. At times, I was even called his blue-eyed boy. He was a good prime minister. He led the cabinet with dignity. But the cabinet was a bit disorganized, his cabinet. There were no standing committees. There were hundreds of ad hoc committees dealing with this specific issue and that specific issue. There were no proper minutes being kept. The junior member of the cabinet had to write just in an old book, short minutes, just noting specific decisions. All that changed when P.W. Buddha became prime minister. So cabinet was a bit disorganized and not very well managed from an administrative point of view. But there were open discussions. Everybody had their say. And John Foster was very democratic in that regard. And your first portfolio, becoming a minister, what was that like? I, I believe that Louis Reeve guided you through the first steps of being a minister. Yes, I was surprised by the portfolios allotted to me because I've never spoken about any of them in Parliament. It was not my field of interest. But in Louis Reeve, I had a director general, 
who was called Postmaster General, who was an excellent teacher. We became very good friends. And he advised me about the pitfalls of being a minister. He helped me to clearly define for myself what is the role of the minister and what is the role of the chief executive of the department, the director general. And uh, so I look back with warm memories of Louis Rie and also with excitement about what we did together. We, in my first year almost, as Minister of Posts and Telecommunications, went abroad, inspected our limited choices in what type of digital telephones we could get into South Africa. And in the end, we bought a system from Germany and a system from France. And we installed the first modernized digital system in South Africa, the German system, even before the Germans did it themselves. So I had great times with Louis Rie, and we achieved a lot. But in general, uh, th this was a, a period of, of little progress in, in race relations. Uh, John Forster was still implementing separate development down to the T. There had been the big shock of uh, Soweto in, in 1976. South Africa was facing more and more pressure from the international community. The one initiative for which uh, Forster was renowned was his outward policy, uh, that he improved relations with Hufet Bueni of the Ivory Coast and with Hastings, Banda, and Malawi. And he even had a meeting with Kenneth Kaonda on the uh, Victoria Falls Railway Bridge. But a lot of people said the problems were not in the rest of Africa. The problems he had to deal with were actually in South Africa. Did you get the sense that nothing was happening, particularly with regard to coloreds and Indians? What was your feeling about the progress being made with our core problem of race relations? My overall impression was that John Foster was shying away from those challenges in a certain sense of the word, that he, he has decided to keep the ship going, to open certain doors, to follow up on certain opportunities, like establishing uh, diplomatic relations with some African states, his outward policy, but that he decided to leave the big questions and the big issues of the so-called urban black and the Coloreds and the Indians to a next generation. But he did do one thing which changed the face of South Africa and which laid the foundation of the abolishment of apartheid later on. And that was in the labor field, he appointed Professor Vian, the Vian Commission, to re, re have a big re-look and to reorganize the whole labor system. This ended up in the Vian report, which ended up in black trade unions being fully recognized, having the same rights as all other trade unions. And uh, from there onwards, the place of the urban black was established in South Africa, that they had certain semi-political rights, namely trade union rights, which really made a major change. I played quite a role in that. I was one of the spokespersons about labor in parliament, uh, and, and I supported the Vian Commission's recommendations. That was before I entered cabinet. And, uh, that made a vast difference. So I think people who say John Foster didn't do enough are a bit harsh on him. And 1978, the year you became a minister, was also a year of crisis in South Africa. It was the, the year of the information scandal. 
uh, huge uh, uh, controversy was caused by media revelations of the fact that the Department of Information had bought the Citizen newspaper. There were secret projects that Eskil Rudy was operating in Washington and Europe and other places. And all of this came to a point uh, where John Forster was actually forced to step down as prime minister. Can you tell us something about the about the storms in the caucus and the and the reaction of MPs like yourself to these developments? Well, yes, uh, of course, Connie Mulder and John Foster denied having any complicity in it. And we believed them. And in that sense of the word, it was a big problem, which they had to manage. We couldn't do much as ordinary MPs. But yes, it was upsetting. Uh, it was a very difficult period for us. Fact of the matter is that later on it came out that there was some involvement and some knowledge on John Foster's side. And as you say in your question, yes, it forced him to step down as prime minister. I was very much involved in that process in the sense that cabinet had meetings and I would be delegated because he, I was close to him, to take messages to John Foster, to clear statements which the cabinet wanted to issue with John Foster. So I went to him regularly and one-on-one -on -one we sat down and discussed his position and uh, what he has to do and what he has to say and what the statement should say and so on. So I was very much involved in keeping my hand under the elbow of John Foster and trying to get an amicable settlement for his retirement. Now, Connie Mulder, who was the leader of the National Party in the Transvaal, was generally seen as the natural, na natural successor to John Foster. But of course, the information scandal had an enormous impact on that, but not so much of an impact that, that Connie Mulder almost won the leadership uh, competition in the National Party caucus at a critical point when, uh, when John Forster stepped down. Can you tell us about that, uh, that competition and how did you feel about it? Who, whom did you support? Well, there was a fierce competition with, uh, with people from the camp of P.W. Buerta and people from the camp of Connie Mulder, canvassing votes, trying to convince people to vote for their candidate. I was never part of a clique. So I, I wasn't in any camp. And I decided not to become a member of any camp. Nobody knew how I voted. I avoided these canvases and just steered clear of them. But in the end, I did vote for Connie Mulder. I think mostly because we both came from the Transvaal and there was within the party a strong North-South competition. And uh, today, in retrospect, I'm, I, I think I made a mistake in voting for him. And this brought P.W. Buerta to the prime ministership. And that will be the subject of our next episode.